Praise the Lord, the church on the move. What does Jesus say about the mission and ministry of his church? Before he leaves to go back to heaven and send the Holy Spirit to empower us as his body to do his works, to spread his message, to, to do, continue doing the things here on earth that he was doing, uh, he does them through us now, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, what, what's our mission mandate? What did Jesus say to his redeemed people? And what did he say for all churches and particularly for the Christian Family Centre? There are two great statements that I think a Christian, a Christ follower, a local church, if they follow it and outwork it, will stay on purpose. Because a church exists as the body of Christ to reflect what the head says. He's alive, he's not dead. He rose from the dead, he went to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit and he still leads, he still speaks, he still ministers, he calls people to represent him. He fills us with the Holy Spirit to enable us, to remind us of his words and his direction. But there are two scriptures that I think uh, you cannot get away from regarding their importance in outlining the purpose of a Christian, the purpose of a local church, and, uh, and that includes us. And the first one is the great commandment, and it's a magnificent and succinct summary of the entire Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament is long, it's 39 books. Genesis to Malachi, a lot of books, maybe a thousand or so pages. And only Jesus could give a summary statement of the whole Old Testament in two sentences. And he says, you wanna know what God's on about? Because you want a, a summary statement of, of Genesis one through to Malachi three, four? Goes, let me give it to you. And uh, uh, it gives us, I think, the great commandment, two of the great purposes that Jesus has for your life and for our churches. And here comes my wife with a nice, hot cup of tea, just how I like it, just in case my vocal cords need a little bit of refreshing. Hey! She loved it yesterday. I could only whisper. I couldn't, I couldn't, say, I couldn't say too much. And uh, well, she liked that, and then she just started talking nonstop. <laughs> it's not true. Um, he gives us the two purposes of his followers and his church through the great commandment. Let's read it because the Pharisees, the religious people, the religious leaders tried to trick him. They tried to trap him. Oftentimes they did that. And he answers their question. And the question they ask is, you know, what's the greatest commandment? You know, kind of smarty pants, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And because there's so many commandments, like there's the, there's the big 10, there's an, then there's another 300 plus minor commandments right throughout the Old Testament. And the Pharisees basically said, you've got to adhere to all of these. And if you violate one of them, you're finished. God's against you. You know, you, and, and so they were heapers of guilt, shovelers of shame. And, and, and so the people were oppressed and suppressed spiritually. And Jesus came to set the captives free. He, he embodied God, he was God in human form. And he came to reveal to us what God the Father was really like. And the picture we get of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we really like, we like the God that he represents. And it does away with the false notions of God that the Pharisees in that time had. And they misrepresented the God of the Old Testament. And so Jesus says this in Matthew 22. Or teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, do you want to say this with me? This is a great scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Notice I emphasize all, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The whole Old Testament's message is about worship. That's what he's saying. He says, you wanna know what God's and, and the Old Testament's on about? It's about human beings 
coming into a relationship with the God of love and living a life of worship, worshiping him. True biblical worship is acknowledging who our creator, redeemer God is and honoring him by making him number one in our lives, giving him first place. And the second commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. One is the vertical side, connecting us with God. The other is the social, interpersonal relationship side, the horizontal. How do we live? If you're connected with this God in a worship environment in, 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 and understand what it means to love him, to worship him, to give him your soul, your heart, your mind, and to put him number one in your life. Do you know what he says? The next thing is horizontally, the social dynamic of that is it'll affect every relationship that you have with your fellow man. Who is your neighbor? Some people interpret this like love your neighbor. You say, oh, my neighbor is the person way down the street. I don't know who he is. Don't even know his name, way over there. No, you know who your neighbor is? The person who's closest to you. Your husband, your wife, your kids, the people you work with, people you play sport with, people who you live with down the street, yes, and you know them, but it's people you know, people you have relationship with. It's your world. And each one of us has a world probably of at least 100 people. And you meet and talk with some of those people on a daily basis, some on a weekly basis, some on a monthly basis but they're your neighbors. And he says here, the second is like the first. It's not the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. This has to do with ministry, service towards others. It's really treating people, it, it, let's nail it down. What does ministry and service really mean to love your neighbor as yourself? It's treating people the way you want to be treated. How do you want to be treated? That's how you should treat your neighbor. It's helping other people in need as you would like to be helped if you're facing that need. And we all face needs, we all face crises. When I faced a medical crisis three years ago, I was in great need. And I tell you, I needed people around me. My wife, my kids, my pastors, my, my extended family. One of my family members now, one of my close family members is, is facing a, a health crisis and I know what she needs. And she needs me to love her and to, to be her neighbor and to offer her and support and, and because I know what I needed and I know what, what she needs. And so there, there are neighbors that you have that are desperately ill and they need your support, your empathy, your understanding, and if possible, to give them a scripture, to give them a song, to give them a psalm, and to encourage them. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's what Jesus said. Goes the whole Old Testament, Genesis 1 through to the end of Malachi. It's about worship of God and doing as much good to your fellow man as possible. Worship and ministry. Now, I wanna state and share on the Christian Family Center's ministry and mission purposes that have been central to our existence since we started in 1976. And I've been around a long time. I've been leading the Christian Family Center since 1978 and have been in uh, uh, serving the Lord really since 1971 when I got saved. And every so often, particularly in charismatic, evangelical, Pentecostal circles, or actually Christian circles, is it's like people are not satisfied with the Bible. They're not satisfied with Jesus. They're not satisfied with the great commandment or the great commission. And they say, what's God, what's God up to this year? You know, it's gotta be different to last year. You know, what's God saying to you about what the vision of the church should be and where should we be going? And, and, uh, and what, what's, this, what, what's a new thing that God's up to? And I just think, man, that's a strange language for me. I have no interpretation to that. And I say to them, well, actually, I'm just still stuck on Jesus. I'm still stuck on the great commandment. I'm still stuck on the great commission. I'm still trying to explore what it means 
to worship God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. I've been in the faith for 50 years, and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of it. How can I graduate to something deeper? What's deeper than that? You've got to go into deeper truth. What's deeper than connecting with God and connecting with people? He says the whole Old Testament is about that. You can get caught up in, in the flesh hooks and the the slaughtering of animals of Leviticus. You can get caught up in spinning chariots in Ezekiel and try and find the interpretation of it. Ah, forget all that stuff. It's the very word of God, but it's got to be interpreted in context. Jesus is saying, do you want to know what it's all about? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations, the Psalms, the Pentateuch. It's about the worship of God, human beings connecting with God, a creator, redeemer God, and then expressing that love that they have for him by doing as much good to their fellow man as possible. That's what it's all about. And so a church can't go wrong, a Christian can't go wrong if they're committed and said, that's my purpose in life. That's my purpose as a local church. Can I hear amen to that? Those watching online, can I hear an amen? Hey, I heard that. Well, those watching channel 44, hey. So therefore, Let me express it in plain language. To outwork the great commandment, the CFC, the Christian Family Center, seeks to wholeheartedly worship Jesus, now notice this, as a way of life. Our weekend services, like this service, the 8.30 service, the Friday morning service, tonight's service, which I'll be speaking at, even our youth, That's really a service on Friday night. They get 50, 60 kids there, and a lot of them don't come to to our main services. So really, there's preaching, there's singing, there's fellowship, there's fun. So in all of our services, what's our primary role? What's, you know, is worship as good as Laura is, and she's magnificent, as fantastic as Patrick and the team were, That's our worship. We come on a Sunday and we sing a few songs and that's our worship for the week, yes? Good, I wanna hear, say no, 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 no. They led us into some beautiful songs that evoked in us some feelings of loving Jesus, understanding him a little bit better about salvation, the cross, the resurrection. But then there's preaching of the word. Then there's the fabulous hospitality team ready to feed the inner part of the outer man out there. There's coffee, there's fellowship sharing together, a lot of talking. What is this when we meet together? What's the primary role of our weekend services? I see them as a weekly spiritual staff gathering. For you are the ministers and you are the missionaries. You are the missionaries out there and you're the ministers in and through the life of the local church. Secondly, the CFC also seeks to minister in Jesus' name by serving people's best interests. That's what ministry and service is all about. Oh, I just haven't been able to stop watching the ceremonies to do with uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, death and now preparing for burial. And I I just, uh, I still find it a bit surreal that she's gone. It's like, hey, said to Kath, it still seems a bit surreal. She's always been there. She's been like our mother. She's been a mother figure, a grandmother figure. Stable, mature, selfless, serving, sort of the epitome. She's so countercultural. <laughs> you know, the culture today, me, narcissism, self, what can I gain? And she represented, I think, a Christ like example of selfless, sacrificial servanthood. And that's why the world's gone agog. Oh, she's no longer there. 70 years she's been doing this stuff. She's never put a foot out of place. She's always served. And now, not just Australia and and the dominions, which she's been the head of state, about 14 of them, but the 54 countries of the Commonwealth, but also countries that are are, are republics that have nothing to do with the British crown, but they're flocking there to London to be at the funeral. Why? Because she epitomised what servanthood is all about, what sacrifice is about, what thinking of others is about. When our Prime Minister rang her 
to talk with her when, when, when her dear husband, Prince Philip, died. She quickly turned the conversation to, how's Australia doing? How's the bushfire victims? How's, how's the COVID situation? How are the floods? She knew what was happening. She's thinking of Aussies, not thinking of herself. And that's what a selfless, sacrificial servant is like. You know, around 60% of us are serving in some ministry role at the Christian Family Centre, which is fantastic. So 60% of you here are serving in some way. And that is good, but it could even be better if everyone was serving in some way. Now, I know it takes time if you're new to the church and you're getting accustomed to it and to understand our vision, our values, our strategy, how we operate. But our aim is to encourage you to serve people. That's the great commandment. And, uh, and so let's all commit to finding a ministry, a service area that fits with our personality, our personality type, and recognising the spiritual gift mix that we have. People are different. People have varying, varying gifts, varying abilities from the Lord. And sometimes it takes others to recognise those gifts and abilities. Sometimes we're not the best judge of that. And, um, and also our, our unique personality type. Like if somebody's a real introvert, really introvert and, and, and timid and a bit insecure, and we have a, an opportunity to someone to be a doorkeeper, to welcome people at church. Well, it's cruel and unusual punishment to put that person there. So we're built differently and we have different gift mix. And one's got to flow within what God has given to them. I shared about Zane Pitt who comes to our 830 service. Zane and a group of men have been praying for nearly 30 years in my office three times a week. Praying for you, praying for me. They pray for me all the time. And I'll tell you, it, when people are sick, oftentimes they go to him rather than to me. Why? Because he uses faith. He's full of the spirit and faith. And, and my wife even said that to me. She said, I'd go to Zane and pray for me. I said, well, that's great. I'm, I'm the pastor. Why don't you come to me? I'll go to him. Because she recognised that there's faith in that man and he believes. And some of you have got a gift of faith. You've got a gift of healing. We want to recognise that. If that's you, you need to be part of our, our ministry prayer team to be praying for the sick or visiting people that are unwell and praying for them, ministering to them. If you have practical gifts, man, see Danny Huber. You see the gardens out there? A group of men and women meet on Wednesday mornings. They have a barbecue together and they serve there. They are fantastic. If I joined that team, the plants would be dead within six months. I wouldn't know what to do. But they love it. They're practical. If you've got green fingers, see Danny. If you've got, you love cooking and you love food and you love helping hospitality, see Jan Taylor and Kathy Vasilakis in the kitchen team and, 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 and that's fantastic. I know um, some, a couple of pastor's wives have told Kathy off over the years because she doesn't sit in the front row when I'm preaching at a national CRC conference, sort of dutifully looking at me and praying for me as I'm preaching. <laughs> she says, you shouldn't be in the kitchen, they said to her. You should be there with your husband. And so Kathy just very politely says, but I love being in the kitchen. She goes, God's called me to be in the kitchen. What is it about the kitchen? It's the team, it's the people, it's my fellowship group where we talk and pray and encourage each other. It's a community. It's a neat, because she's a server. She's got the gift of helps and the gift of service. She's also a good preacher. We know Kathy's skills, but she's got the gift of serving. She's always giving money away. She's always giving clothes away. My clothes, she puts it. She says, oh, you've lost a bit of weight. I'm going to give that, all that stuff away, these clothes. I said, Do not, don't. I said, I'll oh, just take them in. So she just... <laughs> So some people have got serving gifts. They're fantastic in helping and showing mercy to people. Others don't like doing that with people. They like doing it with things. They're more practical. They're the deacons like fixing things and doing things. So practical, pastoral, evangel evangelistic, spiritual. We need creative people. We need musicians and singers. We need, we need people to, so the 40% of you that are not serving, maybe there's a singer, a song leader. A, a, you might have a fantastic you might think you have a fantastic voice. 
we'll make the judgment whether you have a fantastic voice. They'll do a, they'll do a test and they say, hmm, self-delusion there. You know, we can delude ourselves, can't we? Oh, I can play drums like, like Finn. And you try and you put everyone off. No, you can't. Well, so look, some people, you, the best people to assess you for your gifting is others, is their fruit. Can they see it? Let others be the fruit inspectors. And so we say, commit to finding a ministry service area that fits with your personality type and let others assess your spiritual gift mix. Because when it fits, it just flows and it produces fruitfulness that people can see and personal fulfillment that you go, I love this. I could do this for the rest of my life. Everything within me says, I don't want to die. Three years ago, I don't want to die. I, I just enjoy doing what I'm doing. I get great personal fulfillment in ministering the word and in raising up leaders. And I wasn't scared. I want to go and be with the Lord, but I've got things to do. And the sense of fulfillment, it's joyous. And so within service, in serving the best interests of people, there's great personal satisfaction without it being selfish or about you. It's about others. And so there are heaps of practical and pastoral and outreach and creative ministry service areas. And so talk to one of the pastors. Talk to Pastor Janet, Phil, Cass, Sam, Tanya. They're not here today. They're ministering elsewhere. Myself, just talk to a ministry department leader and they may be able to help someone who knows you. You say, okay, we think there's an area here. It's not like we say, oh, there's a job here, so we'll just get you to do that. No, no, we say, what does God want you to do? What are you suited to do? What's your personality type? What's your gift mix? So that it flows, it fits, it flows, it produces fruit and it brings personal fulfillment. And there's nothing more joyous. I've been doing it for 50 years and I could do it for another 50 years. Serving Jesus, serving people, worshiping Jesus and ministering to people. So. If Jesus' great commandment summarizes the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, and we see two purposes, worship and ministry, then Jesus' great commission launches the New Testament era and adds three extra purposes for all Christ followers and for all Christ-centered churches. And the, 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 the great commissions are found in the four gospels and the book of Acts. Who knows where they are? Matthew chapter... 28, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 24, John chapter 20, that's good. Acts chapter one, shame on you. I've only been preaching this for 40 years and you haven't memorized, you haven't memorized the Great Commission chapters at least. I tested my wife on it. She didn't even get one. I said, sweetheart, come on. Why does, does God give us five recordings of the Great Commission, the final words of Jesus? Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, Acts chapter one. To get it through to us that it's really important, it's really important. It's like Jesus says, the Great Commandment is really important. So is the Great Commission. So let's read Matthew 28, his version. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, his boss, his king, there's a beautiful picture of Queen Elizabeth as she goes to heaven, takes her crown off and places it at the feet of Jesus, her king. We're under orders, under his authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go, two thirds of the name of God is go. So why are you complacent? Why are you comfortable? Why are you saying, nah, I just like sitting and, and, and just relaxing and just enjoying and, and I, I don't wanna go? Well, Jesus says the church has gotta be on the move. We've gotta be going. I shared on Friday morning and I saw these beautiful senior people in their 90s. And I say, go. And I say, you may not be able to go physically, but by golly, you can go in your thoughts. You can go in your prayers. You go with your money. 
you go to the whole world. Your tithing, the 10% that we give to God, 10% of that is marked out. 7% goes into our Christian Family Centre church planting fund and 3% goes to our denomination. So you're actually going with your tithes to the whole world. You go with your giving, you go with your praying. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's evangelism. That's church planting. That's world missions. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that's fellowship. In the early church, when water baptisms occurred, it was the sign that you're now part of a Christian community. You're publicly affirming Christ. We did that with 13 or so the other Sunday here and, and, and in the shed. And they publicly affirm Jesus is number one. They flew the flag high saying, I'm a Christ follower. I've made a commitment to Jesus. I'm gonna follow him the rest of my life. And that was entry into the body. That's saying, okay, you've affirmed. You've, the, the Pledge of Allegiance. You've said, I, I belong. And so it, it's connecting people into fellowship. In the early church, <laughs> the early church, I think it's Ignatius' letter, uh, about 110, 120 AD, after the, the, the New Testament was written, they talk about how they baptise people, and they said, you've got to find a running stream. River Torrance, find a running stream, River Murray. Okay. Why running water? Symbolising washing. Washing of sins. So my life has been cleansed. And then you put them down once in the name of the Father, and then in the name of the Son, and if they get up the second time, you do it once in the name of the Holy Spirit. We sanitise it, we've got a little pool here, it's nice warm water, oh, wouldn't it be good to have a running stream outside and we actually said, okay, cold water, summer, winter, put you down three times. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to emphasise that this is a transformative experience that happens when you come to Christ. Water baptism is symbolic of that and now you're part of the Christian community. This is to do with fellowship, getting incorporated into the body and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, discipleship. Worship, ministry or service, the great commandment, the great commission, evangelism, fellowship and discipleship. And he says, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. He goes, I'm with you. You're not on your own. So let me now give you three statements about these three from the Great Commission. The CFC, with purpose and passion, seeks to reach lost people with the good news about Jesus Christ. We are to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8, and to the very end of the age, Matthew 28.20. Like in the book of Acts, folks, that's our pattern. And this involves one-on-one -on -one personal witnessing, developing relationships with people wherever we are, that they would see that we're living, that we're worshiping Jesus as a way of life, that they like what they see in you. And they would ask you, what is it about you that's different? Or there may be opportunities where you're able to, because of need, to share your faith. Personal witnessing arises out of a worshipful lifestyle and, and, and that's how people come to Christ. The number one way by which people come to Christ, 99% are people that know you, that love you, that trust you, that you're able to establish a witness by your lifestyle and by your words and then they come to a meeting like this. Most people need a public service to come to, to hear the gospel. To, for the gospel to be presented. So it doesn't just happen, it happens because of you and me and our personal invitations. But that involves developing connections with people and meaningful connections. And then we birthed new local churches, like we did four years ago at CFC South. I went down there and celebrated with them a few weeks ago, two years ago in Darwin. And we're looking at, hey, next year, we'd love to plant another church. Birthing new churches. That's part of the reaching lost people. And reaching into the nations and, and unreached people groups across our world. Next week, we're taking up our mission offering. What are we, what are we giving it towards? Bethel Centre, Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, they support 50 missionaries, 25 they've sent out, 25 that they support in those nations. One of those young men, Peter Haji, a Papua New Guinean, goes to the Philippines, falls in love with a Filipino girl, marries, he's there for 20 years, he's now our national leader in the Philippines. He's gonna come and share here in a couple of weeks' time. In, in our morning services. And so we support 
Bethel Center, which is not a rich church, to help them fund their missionaries. So uh, we're, we're reaching into the nations and unreached people groups through being a sister church to Bethel Center, Port Moresby. And so that's the book of Acts. One-on-one yeah. -on -one witnessing, leading people to Christ, birthing new churches and reaching across the world. Look what Bishop Leslie Newbingen says. This is his quote. He's a bishop in southern, was a bishop in southern India and um, um, written some fantastic books. Great, great statesman. He says this, the church is the pilgrim people of God. It is on the move, hastening to the ends of the earth to beseech all men, and we can add, and women, to be reconciled to God and hastening to the end of time to meet its Lord who will gather all into one. It cannot be understood rightly except in a perspective which is at once missionary, going out, and eschatological, Christ will come back at the end of time. We have no liberty to stop until both ends have been reached. Indeed, the two ends Jesus taught would coincide since only when the gospel of the kingdom has been preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, only then will the end come. That's what he says in Matthew 24. So when people say, when is Jesus going to come? He says, well, don't focus on that. Focus on how many more people need to hear the message. Are there other nations, other people groups that need to hear? Because that's what your focus should be. The Great Commission, evangelism, church planning. Because don't worry about the eschatological stuff. I'm going to return when I'm ready. I don't even know. The Father knows. Acts chapter 1, Jesus said that. It's not for you to know. Only that the Father knows. Your job is to to receive power from the Holy Spirit and be my witnesses in Adelaide, in South Australia, in Australia, and across the world. So all of our weekend services, folks, including Friday night, where we have a breakout for young kids and our youth ministry on Friday night. So that's really operating like a church, like, like a congregation service. They do all aspects of ministry there. We all endeavour in all of our major services to throw out the net of salvation. And we'll do that today as we take communion together and give you an opportunity, if you haven't received Christ as your saviour, to receive him if you're new and, and, and you're seeking about whether you'll be a believer or not. And that's why we construct our public services, whether it's here, 8.30, Friday morning, Sunday night, Friday night youth, breakout, they're all different. But we try and, and, and construct them so that they're a safe place where you can, you can safely invite people to attend and there won't be a cringe factor. You go, ooh, like... And I know some people in, in some churches that have said, I couldn't invite somebody to my church. Why? Because I'm embarrassed in what they do or some of the antics or... or Uncomfortable. I think, wow, if there's that cringe factor. If we have cringe factors, let me know and we'll decringe it for you. So that you can say, okay, the people that you, you're establishing a witness to, you can, we want you to feel totally safe and at ease that you can invite them to any one of our services and they will hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And to be assured that they will hear the good news and an opportunity given for people to respond. And we're also looking to prayerfully, you know, with prayer to initiate new outreach-oriented ministries, to reach our friends and contacts, which, which also is attractive to our community. I had somebody come up this week, last week, with an idea of a new ministry, potential ministry, which is fantastic. That could impact the community. Yeah. If it takes off, it could lead people to Christ. It could engage with our community. And so you might have an idea. God may speak to you about something to launch, to reach into our non-Christian community where we can share the love of Christ by good works, by good deeds. You know, good works creates goodwill for the good news to be received. And so in this day and age, people don't say, oh, there's a church, they think I'll just come to church. It's usually good works by a church and by people that create goodwill in people's hearts and minds to say, hey, and it opens them up to receive the good news by you or by our public preaching as such. Fourthly, the CFC seeks to enfold new believers into the loving fellowship of Jesus Church. That's fellowship. That's water baptism. You know, evangelism, fellowship. 
We're working to increase the number of life groups. We've got around mid-20s life groups and we want to go to, to say, mid-40s to 50s for a church our size. If you include prayer groups and ministry groups that operate like our bands and, and singers where they pray and talk together and share, there's probably around 40 different small groups and ministry groups, maybe more, that operate. And uh, even our senior leadership team, when we meet together weekly or fortnightly, we're always praying, we're always sharing. It's actually a fellowship group. So we're not separate to being in a small group. When our board meets every, every month or so, uh, we pray. We spend probably an hour out of our three hours meeting, talking, fellowshipping, sharing, praying, eating, eating and, uh, together. So small groups is, is very important. And the best way to build meaningful friendships and a real sense of belonging and community is by meeting together in small groups for fellowship, prayer, Bible reading, or as part of a ministry team that loves to serve others together. So if you're not part of a small group, you're missing out. You can't outwork Jesus' purpose unless you're doing life together with another group of people. And fifthly, finally, the CFC seeks to help disciples become faithful and obedient followers of Jesus. Like I said earlier, we are under orders to the highest authority in the universe. And we need to know what those orders are, folks. We need to know what those guidelines are. We need to know what those principles are so we can align ourselves to them. And this is why reading your Bible, studying your Bible, learning how to apply your Bible is so important. Doing our Bible reading plan, we're doing Psalms at the moment, where you can, you can read, a, read one Psalm or read one chapter of the scripture and, and think it through, observe it, and look at how can I apply the timeless transferable truth. And then I pray, God help me to align myself to this. Use that. 